Good morning and thank you for joining us for our webinar Wednesday session for September 2019. And for today's session, our uh, subject is Fire Risk Assessment to, P to PAS 79. My name is Katie and I look after the IT and digital um, infrastructure side of things here at CABE and I'll be acting as your moderator for this morning's session. We do like to have our webinars nice and interactive and we'd like you to kind of get in touch throughout the session. So if you want to send in any questions or comments to us, you should have a, a question pane either on the right hand side of your screen or at the top of your screen, depending on the device you're using. Just type, the, your, type your question in, just, um, just type it in and it will pop up on our screen. And what we'll do at the end of the session is look to run a Q&A. Now, depending on the number of questions that we get, we may not be able to get to all questions, but we'll certainly do our best. Or if there's any questions on specific um, examples, then we may come back to you sort of separately on those issues. You can also still get in touch if you are watching us on our YouTube channel and um, just send any questions over to info at cbuildy.com and what we'll do is pass those on to the presenter. If you're on Twitter, join in the phone, it's hashtag CABE CPD. So this morning, your presenter is Jamie Davis. Now, Jamie is a technical director for HKA within the fire engineering expert witness sector. He's um, an exceptionally experienced fire risk assessor, having previously been employed by leading consultancies delivering fire risk management solutions across many industry sectors. He is from an enforcement background, having previously worked for Kent Fire and Rescue Service, both in an operational and regulatory capacity. He holds first class honours degree in fire safety engineering, has delivered fire safety design and fire risk management training for many organisations, as well as having lectured on fire engineering design courses. He now works as an expert witness for HKA, providing evidence for litigation cases both in the UK and internationally. So I'll say good morning to Jamie and I will hand over to him to deliver this morning's presentation. So if you give me one moment, Jamie will take over. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, got to uh, uh, flick over. That should hopefully now be working. Is that working, Katie? Okay. I think we should be live now. So, good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Katie. Um, that was easy for you to say, a few of those words. That's a good tongue twister this time of the morning. Um, so, today's webinar is going to be talking about uh, fire risk assessment to uh, past 79. Um, just to give you a bit of a, a background and sort of a, a flavour of uh, the presentation today, we're not really going to cover sort of technical matters, it's more about the process of the, um, the fire risk assessment process to pass 79. Um, uh, technical matters obviously sort of sit outside of the fire assessment process, although we will touch on a few bits um, as we go through. Um, so if I actually talk about the standard itself uh, to, to begin with, uh, the pass and where it came from. Uh, you're probably aware that it's been around for some time. Um, being a publicly available specification that was first written in 2007 uh, by C.S. Todd and Associates, uh, it was then revised in 2012. Um, I hear sometimes a lot of criticism uh, about the PAS, um, pr predominantly uh, from various sectors actually, uh, saying that it's just a tick box exercise and yes, it's not very good. Now, obviously that's person's opinions that's perfectly fine but what I would say um, is I think if it's approached or if people unfairly criticize it as a tick box exercise then they're not really entering into the spirit of what the pass is about because it, it certainly isn't just a template as a lot of people to perceive it to be it's a whole methodology of how to perform a fire risk assessment and certainly uh, it's it, as far as I'm aware, it's the most comprehensive methodology that there is available in order to carry out a fire risk assessment. So I certainly wouldn't call it a tick box exercise. Um, now, obviously, the template at the back, which we will cover a little bit later, um, that is there to, to assist people in order to do a fire risk assessment in that template. But you don't have to use that template. It's only an informative annex. Um, so you, you can create the, um, the template or present the fire risk assessment in any way that you want to, um, but it's the methodology really within the PAS which is the important bit. That's really underpinning uh, what a fire risk assessment is and that the methods in, in how to uh, how to do one, how to employ it and ensure that uh, it's thorough enough to, to meet the requirements of legislation. So before we actually move into the PAS, we'll just briefly cover what a fire risk assessment is. Now, I'm sure most of you, uh, in fact, not all of you that we've got to get in today are very aware what a fire risk assessment is. Um, so really, we just sort of cover what the, the PAS definition is, uh, really. Um, so this is what 
the PAS79 definition of a fire risk assessment is, so in the process of identifying fire hazards and evaluating the risk to people arising from them, taking into account the adequacy of existing fire precautions and whether or not the fire risk is acceptable without further fire precautions. So really what that's just absolutely saying is we're looking at uh, evaluating what's there now, is it acceptable? Do we need anything further? And I think that's quite important. Um, certainly, the PASS has a, a, a more sort of in-depth um, definition as well as you look through, which is a systematic and structured assessment of the fire risk in the relevant building for the purpose of expressing the current level of fire risk, determining the adequacy of existing fire precautions and determining the need and nature for any additional fire precautions. Now, thinking about the wording of those two definitions, I think that's important because what a fire risk assessment isn't is it's not a prescriptive audit against existing codes. And I, I think I've, I've seen fire risk assessments uh, many times, I'm not sure you, know, you have as well, where uh, people have literally just applied a code, uh, whether that be the fire risk assessment codes or even sometimes ADB or, or other British standards, and literally just try and apply that to the building without actually considering the risk. Well, that's not a risk assessment. That is an audit, effectively. You're auditing against a code. And although, you know, arguably, you wouldn't necessarily have an unsafe building by doing that, that's not in the spirit of what a risk assessment is about. And that certainly wouldn't be um, taking into account, obviously, the, the client's um, requirements and needs for that. And it might not be acting in the best uh, uh, let's side of your client also. So that's certainly what a fire risk assessment isn't. Um, so certainly, I hear a lot as, as well, as, as I'm sure you do, that, oh, well, the building was signed off by building control. It, it must be absolutely fine. Um, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that it complies with the law. Um, certainly, we've got other considerations which we which we consider, which we'll talk when I'm just going through the presentation today about what a fire risk assessment should be looking at, and that doesn't necessarily mean just all the physical fire protection measures which we would necessarily require under building regulations. So, just because a building has passed the building regulations process doesn't mean it actually complies with either the Fire Safety or the Fire Scotland Act. So. Why, why do we bother doing a fire risk assessment? What is the actual point? Well, quite simply, the law requires it. Um, all of the UK legislation, as you can see there, um, all requires a fire risk assessment. They're, all the legislative requirements are, are, are very, very similar in, in all those legislation. In fact, the, the Scottish and the Northern Ireland legislation is virtually identical. Um, but it, they all require that a fire risk assessment is carried out in some form. So how do we do a fire risk assessment? Well. Sticking with the, the English and Welsh legislation, the fire safety order for the moment, just for the purposes of guidance, um, there's a selection of guides which are produced and they, uh, they are there for the purposes of to assist the layperson and also um, professionals and enforcers as well of how to conduct a fire risk assessment. Um, I personally think these guides are quite good. I, I know they get a, a bit of criticism. Um, I think they're a very good sort of entry level into fire safety um, and, I, and I think they do provide a good overview. Um, the guides interestingly are, are identical in Northern Ireland. Uh, their, their badge in Scotland have their own guides um, as, as well. Uh, which I, th I think are a little bit harder to follow personally, but um, the information is similar and also to account for some of the additional requirements in Scotland. <clears throat> but within those guides, it provides you with these five steps. And now these five steps um, are quite fundamental and you notice they're very health and safety based uh, methods of doing um, a fire risk assessment. Uh, and I think in particular, when we look at identifying fire hazards, I mean, it, you can see that there's the, the health and safety element creeping into this. Uh, looking at uh, the source of ignition, uh, the source of fuel, and the, and the sources of oxygen, very sort of uh, fundamental fire triangle uh, approach to looking at fire hazards, which wouldn't necessarily be unfair uh, to look at. But I think the sources of oxygen is a very, very interesting thing to to look at. Um, I recall uh, when when I did some accreditation some years ago for a certain health and safety body. Um, when I actually did my uh, fire risk assessment to, to be submitted for uh, being signed off, um, I was actually marked down on my risk assessment because I didn't identify a desk fan uh, that could have potentially been a source of oxygen. I mean, you know, take that as you will, but that's utter ridiculous. I think when you look at PAS 79, it doesn't even mention sources of oxygen within the process of identifying fire hazards, merely because we understand that 
atmospheric oxygen is obviously going to contribute to fire and although there may be further specialist risk HVAC systems or oxygen systems whatever which may present that but for standard risk assessment you wouldn't really be considering anything other than atmospheric conditions um, and quite simply looking at the moving now to step two uh, identifying people at risk uh, you notice that it's, it's talking about people in or around the premises or people especially at risk really hinging out the uh, the relevant persons issue from the fire safety order about what a relevant person is and then looking at evaluating removing reducing and protecting from the risk so this is the protection measures now we, we assume that a fire is going to start we, we know we can't get that risk down to zero so what is actually in the building then to assist people to, to get out effectively and be safe should that fire happen and then step four looking at recording and planning and forming strats all of, sort of the management aspects around that making sure that we're recording our fire risk assessment we're in, 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 telling everyone about it and we're training we're cooperating with different people that's what that's all about and looking then to continually review now that's the basic five steps which is uh, generally uh, accepted by government guides um, and a lot of risk assessment methodologies however PAS 79 looks at it a little bit more in depth and it actually has a nine-step approach and we're going to cover these nine-step approach or this nine-step approach sorry um, the, this morning and talk about the process so when we consider then um, the principles of fire risk assessments uh, particularly from PAS 79 um, PAS 79, as, as we already said, it is a structured and systematic assessment. So that's looking pretty much at the, the entire uh, premises, um, generally, that anywhere which is going to constitute a, a risk to people, we need to consider the, the whole premises holistically and ensure that people aren't going to be put at risk. Um, this is something which I think is abused a lot, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, fire risk assessment should be a genuine and open-minded approach uh, to fire safety within the premises i do find quite often as i'm sure you've seen and i'm sure you've you may have even done as i think we're probably all guilty of at some point where a fire risk assessment has been used to try and justify a decision which has already been made um, that's really not what a fire risk assessment is about and it shouldn't be used to do that we should be looking at uh, something holistically um, and subjectively really looking at the risk and thinking okay is, is that thing okay what we've done we shouldn't be trying to justify everything just because we've already made it particularly on a financial basis with the fire risk assessment as, as we'll talk about as we go through um, and we've already touched on it as well um, that it does look at things just beyond the physical fire precautions within the building. Yeah, that the, the physical fire precautions are certainly the uh, the starting point, but there's all the management aspects that we need to consider as well within that, which might it goes a little bit certainly above what uh, building regs would require. Uh, and we, we need to uh, to assess that really within the fire risk assessment. Um, something which um, happens quite often is I've, I've seen request from building control officers to ensure that a fire risk assessment is in place prior to um, the building being handed over. Now, I would certainly argue and certainly that the, the pass highlights that you can't really do that um, because because ultimately the fire risk assessment is an assessment and, and it's an assessment of actual working conditions. You can't really assess uh, the management arrangements uh, until everything is up and working. And now I appreciate you can do sort of something partially uh, and, and maybe do things in principle, but for, for me, that, that's not really a thorough um, fire risk assessment. And, and I mean, you, you get the chicken and the egg situation where you, you may have um, people just moved into a building and things aren't fully established. So it might actually be that as you continue to review that fire risk assessment down the line, that's when it actually starts to show a bit more worth. Um, obviously, likelihood and consequences uh, when we consider risk, um, that they sort of need to be looked at separately within a fire risk assessment, as arguably they should most risk assessments. Um, and when we consider you know, we look at fire risk, for example, if we've got a, a single story uh, in industrial unit, for example, with loads of um, fire exits and everybody can get out of the building, it's, it's possible that the fire likelihood is quite high because of processes which are happening within the building. But actually, the risk to life is very little or very small because uh, there's lots of exits, a very small travel distances and people can get out. Where if you put that against um, something like a multi-occupied office building, uh, high rise, uh, where actually the fire risk is potentially quite low, um, the uh, the consequences could potentially be higher due, just due to the uh, the construction of the building, uh, the means of escapes arrangements. So um, th that's why we sort of need to look at them quite separately. Um, and particular fire risk assessments, 
often are trying to achieve zero risk. Now, obviously, this is a point of debate uh, to look around, but what is an acceptable level? Now, um, I conveniently put the little diagram down in the bottom right there, but I mean, what that's suggesting is, is should we always be trying to aim for absolutely zero risk? Is that proportionate that we need to be doing that? Or should we be looking at a position where the risk is tolerable and the risk is safe enough, the building is safe enough, is where we should be looking? I mean, some organisations, clearly, they want to throw more money at it. They want to ensure that the risk is even lower. And that's absolutely fine. You know, that's certainly not a criticism and, and we'd be very happy for, for people to do that. But from a risk assessor's perspective, um, particularly if we're working um, uh, trying to get the client happy as well from a financial perspective we need to be looking that it's safe enough and it complies with the law um, here's one of the schematics um, from past 79 really just to um, what this is trying to identify here is that um, certainly uh, the fire protection uh, the consequences um, are separate really from from hazard identification with, with um, uh, the likelihood of fire and it's about separating them up and looking at you've got different control measures for um, each potential um, uh, hazard effectively then they feed into the um, the assessment of the likelihood and the consequences then that whole thing then becomes a fire risk assessment before we then look at putting the action plan together so one of the first steps or the first step really with, within um, uh, past 79 as you will recall is looking at for relevant information now, obviously, this is something which the fire step approach doesn't really cover. So nearly this is now looking to like what is relevant to the fire risk assessment. Uh, we've got a building which does certain processes. Uh, you know, obviously, we've got people with certain things there or whatever. So we're really about looking at how is this building going to impact um, on the fire safety and, and the ultimately the, the safety to occupants. So these are sort of things that obviously we should be looking at. Oh, we need to consider the people. Okay, that's absolutely uh, the most important thing. Fire safety legislation is all about people. Yeah, it's all about ensuring that people are safe. So ultimately, at the heart of that, we need to look at those people and look at their needs. Um, now, just obviously a few examples of uh, you know, the, the type of occupancies that we could have. You know, we, we could have hospitals. We could have um, sleeping arrangements and hotels. We could have people who might be engrossed in films, people who may be uh, uh, you know, intoxicated on alcohol, or people who may require additional help to evacuate. So we need to really be understanding um, that the people within the building and looking about what their needs may be in the event of a fire. And something which certainly should never be forgotten is, is children and the potential of having children in the building and how they may react. And of course, we know that under fire safety legislation, if you have uh, young employees, then there's additional measures and additional risk assessments that need to be undertaken uh, should you employ young people as well. Um, but also not just the people, although we're trying to ensure the safety of people, it's their surroundings which are also gonna make a difference. And so the type of building they're in uh, will have an impact. So it's about understanding perhaps the building construction, uh, the, the type of building layout, um, what's the building used for, where is the building, about taking all of this into account within the fire risk assessment. So once we've taken that information, we'll start then to identify um, the, the hazards, uh, the fire hazards in particular that we've got uh, within the building. Obviously, the, um, uh, the, the fire hazard being any, anything which has the potential to, uh, to cause a fire. Um, so looking at uh, the individual hazards and how we're going to control them or even better eliminate uh, those hazards. Uh, just obviously the, the fire triangle principle. Um, so PAS 79 covers quite a few aspects. Obviously, we won't necessarily go for more in, in detail, but these are the sort of areas which PAS 79 covers. And certainly these lists aren't meaning to be um, exhaustive uh, these are just indicative because you know, there may be uh, maybe more areas or maybe less areas depending in your building to, to what you're looking at um, but there's some interesting ones there um, in particular obviously smoking i think that the risk has decreased with uh, uh, smoke smoking in buildings now due to the health act obviously uh, prohibiting smoking within workplaces etc um, but lighting protection as well, you know, again, that's that's a subjective thing. Um, I, I think even though lightning protection is certainly a, a, a good thing to have uh, from a fire protection point of view, there's certainly no legislative requirement under fire safety law to have lightning protection and it would certainly never be enforced. But it's something which uh, which is good, uh, particularly in tall buildings, uh, but certainly within and I think the important thing to understand within the fire risk assessment as well is that these are sort of snapshots into these areas. I mean, because obviously an area of lightning protection, I would guess that most fire risk assessors aren't going to be specialists in lightning protection. I'm certainly not. And so if you are under any um, 
doubt whether a building should have a system or not, then certainly you would put as a recommendation within a fire risk assessment to seek the advice of a specialist, basically. So they're the sort of preventative areas which you would be looking at. Um, then the, what PAS 79 would want you then to do is assess the likelihood of fire. So after you're, you're looking at all the, uh, the, the potential fire hazards and things that could cause a fire, looking to assess the likelihood. Now, PAS 79 uses a three by three matrix, uh, which is quite a simple matrix. Uh, and over the left of the table there, you'll see there's a likelihood either being low, medium or high. Um, now, obviously that's um, subjective and it is a subjective assessment, but um, I think when you have to look at the likelihood of fire as well, it's important to look at it in the context of the building for what it's actually being used for. So. I, I mean, when you look at something which, I don't know, the, the, the typical stonemasons uh, where, where you might have a particularly low fire risk, um, is, is it a low fire risk for that building or actually is it just, um, is it medium for the type of building being used? But I mean, ultimately it's going to be a low likelihood of fire. We, we have, um, that that's from the industrial premises, you know, that's certainly going to be in the low category. Um, for general, most um, areas you're going to be looking the medium uh, and certainly anything with domestic uh, if you're looking at flats um, I think you're always going to be in the medium unless you've got any uh, evidence as opposed to the contrary um, I would never see that going into low uh, very 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 rare so you're always going to be medium or above because uh, it's just impossible really to, to try and uh, classify likelihood of fire in domestic premises you know when you're looking at flats because um, there's just too many unknowns, uh, but at least in the workplace we can control it. Um, so likelihood is always really going to be around the medium or higher, unless you've got something, you know, like stonemasons, which is really quite tangible, saying no, actually it is a low likelihood. I, I, I can't think of many examples, to be honest, where I've actually used the low likelihood. But again, that is totally subjective. Uh, and, and something uh, we, we, uh, that we need to consider as well around the consequences versus the likelihood. Uh, quite often I do see these mixed up where people will um, perhaps go to a low likelihood of fire um, with, with a uh, sort of a moderate harm type approach. Look, they're still coming out as a moderate risk, where actually what they meant was the other way around. So, so do make sure that you, uh, uh, you, you're putting it the right way around effectively. Okay. So once we've looked at the fire hazards, we need to then look at the fire protection measures uh, and actually sort of um, ascertain uh, when that fire starts. As we said, we, we're going to um, uh, we, we can't reduce that risk to zero. That it, it is, it's impossible. We, we always have to assume a fire will start, uh, and obviously that is the intention with between all fire safety codes. All fire safety codes do assume that there will be a fire. So now we're looking at how we're going to protect um, occupants uh, in the event of fire, and these are the areas which Pass 79 gets you to look at basically. Um, so when we look at the protection from means escape perspective, uh, these are all the uh, the areas. Uh, which it gets you to look at. Uh, quite simple, I think. So in actual fact, looking at the escape route design uh, fundamentally, is it actually going to do, do its do its job? Uh, is, 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 is it appropriate? Uh, travel distances, are they within um, generally acceptable limits? Now, we'll talk about um, in, in a little bit about the application of codes and what this actually means, um, because what we do find, um, or, or what certainly what I've seen previously, uh, is people might criticise the travel distance because it's marginally over, where actually we do need to consider that in the bigger context of risk. Um, so travel distance is actually a very good example uh, within a fire risk assessment of how it actually may or may not be an issue. But I mean, when we actually consider travel distance within codes, uh, we know that there are many codes out there that have different um, varying travel distances for the same premises. So really it's quite an arbitrary thing. Um, so if really we've got a travel distance which is meant to be 18 metres uh, and it's sort of 19. How <laughs> much of an issue with that really? So we, we need to, to, have, to have a look at that and, and make a subjective assessment. Um, so yeah, look, running down the list, obviously dead ends, uh, number distribution width, making sure that we've got um, enough exits, the amount of people in the building, quite frankly, um, and protecting the scope if they need protecting to make sure uh, that we're not going to uh, fill them up with smoke so people can get out. Um, and looking at the ability of occupants to use the escape routes as well. You know, coming back to thinking about the people, um, you know, we might have identified that we've got wheelchair users. Are the escape routes suitable for, for wheelchair users? You know, simple things, but it's, it's just really about thinking about it. Uh, adequate signs and notices, do we have that? Uh, and again, lighting, uh, making sure that the exit is easily usable and that they're unobstructed. 
It also then goes to talking to about protection measures, uh, active protection measures. So fire alarm systems, fire detection alarm, that might be manual call points up to you know all signal dancing, L1 category, smoke detection everywhere. It could be what the building needs. Um, EVCs, emergency voice communication systems, if they're needed. Uh, again, emergency lighting within the, the active measures. Uh, first aid firefighting, maybe. Uh, fire suppression systems. Uh, smoke control systems, if needed, and facilities for the fire and rescue service. This is what the PAS would ask you to look at from an active protection measures point of view. Um, also, it needs to look at passive measures as well. So all of these things, so I'm not going to go into the technical aspects of it today, it's more about the process, uh, but looking at all these things here uh, to ensure that they're in place and they're actually doing their job. Now, when we consider some of these aspects like cavity barriers, um, now that might not always be easy to do. Um, in particular, uh, for any of you who do fire assessments on flats, you'll be aware that um, uh, you, you know, there's, there's various ways of doing fire assessments on flats and, and the guidance which is out for that, um, that, um, that gives you um, sort of uh, type one to four uh, uh, fire risk assessments with with one being a, a very simple uh, risk assessment which isn't destructive up to a type four which is destructive there may be occasion w within buildings where you need to be destructive to ascertain exactly what it's got um, but cavity barriers doesn't necessarily mean to be the, the barriers within a, within a cavity wall it, it, it could be like roof barrier systems as, as i've got in the picture there it could be um uh you know many types of systems but what we're trying to get at with this is just saying that there may be occasion where you do need to take that fire risk assessment that little bit further uh, in order just to ascertain that you have got things. If those cavity barriers are um, certainly uh, critical to the evacuation of that building, um, so you'll need to go as far as what you think you need to within that fire risk assessment. Things like with dampers and things as well, that they can be difficult, um, as you know, on a, a visual inspection to ascertain if they're there. Um, so. But what you tend to then pull out within the risk assessment when you start to look at the management side is you start to pull out how well they're maintained and you, you then start to get a flavor about what might be there what might not be there uh, through that through that interviewing and through looking at other paperwork and, and the management aspects um, again something like fire protection to the structural frame structural fire resistance how critical is that within a fire risk assessment Again, it's, it's your judgment call within something like um, uh, you know, a single story building that's only got it there from a, um, for keeping a wall up for, for boundary purposes, that might be a lot less critical than a high rise building where it's got phased evacuation and that uh, structural fire protection is there you know, for the person keeping the building up while, while you're evacuating. So they, they can be very different things. Um, and that's, what, that's why we need to consider the building as holistic risk i know i keep saying that but it is a, it's a holistic risk not just things individually um and arguably probably one of the most important bits to look at uh, within uh, the fire risk assessment is the management because because I, I think ultimately everything which you'll assess previous all does hinge on the organization's ability to manage it effectively um, and this is what really sets the fire risk assessment aside from building control approval now I'm aware now that um, a lot of building control bodies are, are, are really quite on the ball with this now and, and asking for um, details about actually how you're going to manage the building, how, how it's designed, how's it going to be managed. But as we know, there's, there's limited, uh, uh, if any, requirement actually in the legislation that which requires that. Um, but, but the at least in the fire safety order, it, it is an absolute requirement. You know, at least it's not in, just inferred. Um, so th this is really um, where it comes into its own. The fire risk assessment is actually looking for the the, uh, the the management assets of the building actually who's actually going to own fire safety and this is what how the PAS looks at it so actually who's going to take that overall responsibility and who's going to manage fire safety moving forward um you know has have people got super access to, to specialist advice when they need it um, you know are there adequate fire procedures in place um it's, it's looking at um making sure that people are, have been given special duties or, or appropriate duties in the event of fire fire wardens or or assistance with evacuation that sort of thing uh, liaising with the fire and rescue service if necessary um making sure that we're inspecting the building that could be part of the you know the general health and safety regime that might be uh, specialist fire safety inspections um but importantly as well staff training do staff actually know what to do when that far
really, really important stuff. Um, provision of information to the third parties, but in particular employers, um, you know, there's, a, there's an absolute requirement for that within the fire safety orders. So meaning where we may have um, contractors in the building maybe, it's about ensuring that their employees are aware of all of the um, of the fire safety arrangements and we, you know, we, we don't just come in, sign in and off you go. It's about making sure they're aware of everything that's in place. Um, making sure that we're testing and maintaining everything that's in the building, we know that. Um, now record keeping, um, interestingly, um, you may or may not know that there's actually not uh, a requirement within the fire safety order for um, keeping records and maintenance, for example. There, there is a requirement for keeping records of fire safety arrangements, as in the general approach for uh, management of the building. Um, but for record keeping, uh, for, for maintenance, there isn't actually a requirement, but obviously the PAS would recommend you do it clearly, and most British standards do, because I think you'd struggle to demonstrate due diligence if you didn't, quite frankly. Um, and also importantly, part of the risk assessment um, is the cooperation and coordination between duty holders in premises in multiple occupation. You know, the classic being you've got premises which share means of escape and what you don't want doing is one organisation um, filling it up with something or, or, or impacting something on their building, which is going to impact the means of escape for others. So it's about having that cooperation and coordination there. Now, I'm sure most of you will have um, identified within these management lists that a lot of these are actually legal requirements anyway. So it's not like the PAS is some expects going massively above and beyond. A lot of this area is just enshrined within legislation anyhow. It's just extracting that and just giving you that prompt and just making sure that you're, you're asking the right questions on a fire risk assessment so you can be compliant with the law. Okay, so once we've got all that information together, then the, what this is asking you to do is actually make the assessment, the actual fire risk assessment of the consequences of a fire. Okay, so we're going to have a fire. What's actually going to be the consequences based on the management and protective measures now we know. Now I'll bring up the um, uh, the ASET uh, line in, in terms of available escape evacuation time. Um, I'm sure most of you would be familiar with this in particularly from any fire engineering codes. Uh, you may have seen that in 9999 or the BIS uh, 7974 series. Um, basically for, for any of you who might not be very familiar with this, all fire safety hinges are on, on these principles. Um, and it's, it, it is a basic principle that anything from um, a, you know, the most simplest designs in ADB up to the most complex fire engineer buildings, they all use this approach. And it's a very simple um, approach from the point of, of the point of ignition from a fire over on the left. There will be a point in time when it's detected. Then there will be a point in time until the alarm is raised because it might be an automatic system, it might be a verbal system, whatever. Then it, there will also then be a point that it takes people to recognise that that is a fire. You know, whether the alarm sounding or to be told to actually start to actually do something. And then the response time in terms of the, the amount of time it might take people then to actually get up and move. Um, we think something like uh, the, the big impacts on that might be sleeping accommodation, you know, where um, uh, we've the recognition and response time might be quite big, particularly in something like a hotel. In actual fact, if you look at the, uh, the fire engineering code, um, 7974 PD6, that talks about response times in hotels and they get people moving uh, within a hotel. Um, then once you've actually got people moving, uh, then obviously you've got the time to get them to a, a, an exit, which is the travel time. Um, so then you're looking at all of that together as, as a sort of a calculation. Now, obviously, the fire risk assessment isn't expecting you to go through um, fire engineering principles and calculate this. You know, it's not expecting that, but it is looking at a subjective assessment. And, and we'll talk through a few examples in a minute of, of how this can be relevant. Um, but ultimately, what we're trying to look to do is make sure that everybody is out of the building prior to it being untenable. It's as simple as that. That say so that the very it's a very basic principle which is enshrined in every aspect of fire uh, safety design really. So we come back to this um, the risk level estimator again. You know on the three by three we've looked at the likelihood on the left. So now we're looking at the likely consequences based on what we've uh, looked at from from a set. We know how long it's going to take people to get out of the building. So now we're looking at um, what's going to be the likely consequences? Is it a simple office block actually where they're all going to be out done and dusted in, in a few minutes? Then we're going to be in the slight harm category is likely uh, of, of the consequences. But should it be, you know, 
uh, a place where we're housing people uh, who, who, who don't necessarily have great cognitive ability, who drink alcohol all the time, uh, that we might be sort of in the moderate, maybe the extreme, depending uh, on the base of what protection measures we've got in place. You know, but what we try and do is just mitigate that by putting in additional protection, isn't it? That's how we get to that. Uh, and that's the whole purpose of the risk assessment. Okay. So once we've done all that, um, what we're then looking to do is try and formulate an action plan, um, put an action plan together um, to try and reduce that risk and acceptable level. It may be that actual facts, you, you, you do nothing. Um, I, I think I can probably count on one hand uh, the amount of buildings I've gone to uh, and we've done nothing, to be perfectly honest. Um, but there's usually always something to do, and it might be quite minor, but usually there'll be an action plan to uh, to reduce those, uh, reduce the risk to a more acceptable level, or even just a little bit better. When we consider, you know, the, the as low as reasonably practicable, actually for a little outlay for just a little tweak here, does it give you significant benefits to reduce that risk? It may do, it might not do. So that's the whole purpose of the, uh, the risk assessor's job is to try and make that judgment. Okay. So these are the thought of things we need to consider when putting an action plan together, okay? So once, once we're putting the, um, the revised controls in, as in you know, the things that you're gonna um, suggest that needs to happen, is that going to uh, make sure that, that the, the fire risk levels are tolerable? You know, because there's no point doing a fire risk assessment giving people a load of recommendations only for the risk not to really change. You know, it has to defeat the object. So we need to make sure that it is gonna go to a tolerable level. Um, really, really um, important as well is a new our new hazards created by um, doing anything you're doing. Um, so I don't know. Um, perhaps uh, an example I can think of is uh, putting self closers perhaps um, on doors with um, uh, in in some healthcare premises uh, for mental health, for example. Um, those of you who work in healthcare know that we don't generally put them on um, uh, doors uh, with. Um, uh, within hospitals that took care of mental health because of the possible ligature risks. So we, we don't put them in there for that reason. So are we creating new hazards by doing that? And we need to consider these through. Um, and, and certainly are the most cost-effective solutions being chosen? I don't think you'd be acting in your client's best interest if you're not, but that's open for discussion, clearly with the client to talk about. Um, and we also think about how, um, what, yeah, how will the occupants be affected? Or what what will be affected, and, and um, yeah, is it actually going to work for them ultimately? Um, and certainly, will the revised fire precautions uh, will they be adopted, and actually will they be maintained uh, in practice and not ignored? Um, as we've seen many times, you know, you put a self closure on the door because that's the right thing to do. You go, and next time it's got a wedge on it because actually it was just in the way. So it's just about thinking through. Actually, is it going to work? So again, these are the things that we've just spoken about. Uh, this is what the PASS 79 approach would take you through, making sure that it is proportionate. It talks about time scales as well. I'll show you on an action plan in a minute that the sort of um, recommendations it does with respect to time scales, but we're also about prioritizing tasks as well. So clearly, if we've got a fire resistant door that needs replacing because it's broken, it's probably a bit more important than putting a sign up. Yeah, so it's about making sure that we prioritize those tasks and thinking about the practicality of what we're actually recommending as well. And remember, we're aiming for that tolerable risk. We're not aiming for zero, and that ties in nicely to as low as reasonably practicable when we consider the, you know, the, the, the risk versus proportionality to ensure that we're spending an appropriate level of money for what, actually what we're trying to achieve. And certainly, we're not trying to create new hazards, as we said. Uh, something also which um, is important, although not specifically mentioned in past 79, I do think it's important to um, talk about it within the context of the law, we do need to consider the hierarchy of controls, you know, the principles of prevention listed within the fire safety order. Um, certainly, just because something uh, isn't quite right, a phrase that I quite often hear is, oh, we'll manage it, we'll manage it. Well, no, actually, let's look at the hierarchy of controls. Can we put any engineering controls in beforehand to make it so it hasn't got to be managed? We take the human element out. Just think about that, uh, you know, within that within your action plans. So that's what a typical action plan can look like. Um, so you'll notice that there's a priority, um, uh, then the, the key for the priority is at the top. So it, obviously a number, number one being the most important, down to three, saying well, it might not necessarily be even be a bridge of legislation, but it's a good idea to have it done uh, with timescales as well, or suggested timescales. Now, 
Um, depending on your view on timescales, um, I'm personally of the view that they should be discussed with the budget holder and some risk assessments, I wouldn't even recommend a timescale. That's down for the budget holder to uh, to, to lead themselves because obviously they know what their expenditure plan is for the next 12, 18 months, whatever. Um, but you might want to put something suggested as the past recommends there. There you go. And that's just a, another example of some there. Um, and something... Um, but I've, I've heard quite often is, so well, you only need to record the significant findings of a risk assessment. You don't need to record the risk assessment, only the significant findings. Well, yeah, that would be right, actually. That's actually what the legislation says. Uh, it actually says prescribed information. But what actually does that mean? Well, there you go. That's what the law says. Um, so you've got the, um, the fire safety order and uh, the, uh, the fire safety regulation of Scotland there. And what that's basically saying, um, if we look at the, the fire safety order, is the significant fines of the assessment, including the measures which have or will be taken by the responsible person pursuant to this order. So it's not just the things which are wrong, which quite often people say they are. Um, it's pretty much anything of what you find within the risk assessment is a significant finding. In fact, I would probably argue the only thing that isn't a significant finding is the address. <laughs> I, I think most of it Otherwise, it would be showing how you're demonstrating compliance of the order, in which case that's what significant finding is. Uh, but of course, you only need to record the risk assessment should you employ five or more people or there's a license enacted on the premises. Or in the case of the fire safety order, there's an alterations notice in place as well. But to be honest, if you've gone through the process of a risk assessment, why not record it? It's the sensible thing to do. Um, so get, there you go. There's a typical PAS 79 form. Um, which uh, the, the most important things with all these forms of the comments boxes, uh, actually filling out the justification of what your ticks have been for the previous section. Okay, but do have a look through the PAS and have a look through the uh, uh, through the um, the template at the back. Once we've obviously we've done the risk assessment, we've given that to the, uh, the the person to do implement whatever. We need to review that as well. Okay, it is important that we understand it is a live document. It's not just going to go on the shelf, get dusty till next year. It is about keeping it constantly monitored, updated, um, and the, the review period can and will vary depending on the risk presented. Um, so you know it said should be reviewed regularly uh, within the laws, but that could be you know a, a year that could be six months it just really will depend uh, on what the premises are being used for but arguably if you're keeping it constantly reviewed anyway then you wouldn't necessarily need to review it when a significant change occurs because you've already got there with it um, that would be another time when you review it is if any significant changes occur um, within that time period or you have a reason to suspect it's no longer valid maybe a fire uh, something like that uh, and as to why you should review it uh, and do remember, though, uh, review is not redo. So we don't necessarily need to redo the entire re assessment. It's just reviewing what you've written uh, and to ensure that it is valid or, or might need alteration. Um, so how does the PASS um, actually deal with premises that don't conform to the current standards then? Um, obviously, we know that there's very uh, different standards out there over the years. Some buildings might not even have been built uh, prior to the PASS coming out. Um, but it, what the PASS says is if you're going to risk assess a building which, which did comply to any of those standards is you have a knowledge of those standards which were enforced at the time um, and that you, you are able to identify the shortcomings in the premises um, from that from current guidance um, and you need to assess that if those short, shortcomings actually put people at unacceptable risk and it's all about again assessing the risk holistically so what the PAS does is give you this nice uh, flow chart uh, to assist you which is really good actually so it, it's starting you at the or well, does it meet the, the, the five precautions uh, at the moment we'll know did it meet them at the time actually do those shortcomings uh, place people at you know particular risk so if you just follow that flow chart through it's quite good to get you to the end so if you what you should be doing but again it is only a guide um, ultimately you know you're the risk assessor you're the person making that judgment at the time but really what it's just trying to say is just because something doesn't comply to modern standards doesn't mean it's a risk Okay, that some of these these um, existing standards have been perfectly fine for many many years, um, and it's just about now accessing is the risk acceptable. It may be that we do need to tweak a few things, um, but it's just about making that judgment. So you know you could have historic buildings, um, which um, might be an issue. Um, uh, yeah, because obviously there wouldn't have been some, you know, a picture of the old schools at Cambridge Air, so building our risk assessed a long time ago. Um, it, that didn't conform to any standards. So it's about just making the, the assessment of, of actually is it acceptable. So, you know, 
a 1970s hotel back in the day might not have actually had automatic fire detection, for example. Now, whilst we, when we look at that against modern standards, clearly it's not to modern standards. Does it pose a risk? Yeah, it does. You know, we, we need to have automatic detection and sleeping risks, certainly. So that's a, a situation where we would certainly upgrade. But then if we look at the classic uh, intermessile strips on forests indoors argument, um, you know, that doesn't comply to modern standards, absolutely. But how much of a risk is it? If we've got a building with stay put, like flats, it might be more of a risk, um, along with perhaps progressive horizontal evacuation in resi care. It might, again, it might be more of a risk here where we're relying on that door for a longer period of time, as opposed to an office building where everyone's going to be evacuating in two minutes. Yeah, so it's really about thinking what risk does that failure not to comply with the current code present? Uh, and if we get into heritage buildings, uh, things which are quite um, away from the norm, then we might need maybe not start doing some fire engineering calculations uh, and actually assess have what we've got in place is appropriate. Um, so what does the uh, you know the existing code what do they actually look like in terms of uh, the pass? Well again it does remind you that there isn't a legal requirement to follow codes. Okay they are there as guidance um, and they certainly shouldn't be blindly applied. Okay that does happen too much unfortunately but they should be considered in the bigger risk picture. However that being said, the past does point you towards technical codes. Uh, and an example that it does use um, is that, you know, there might be deficient wiring um, or something, and the uh, the risk assessor wouldn't uh, would point you in the direction, you know, of having it fixed to uh, BS7671, uh, um, ensuring that you, um, that's a technical code, which is, is appropriate. Same as a fire alarm code, you know, it would be good practice to point something in the direction of a fire alarm code. Um, but general fire safety codes and guides, they are there as a guide, and they certainly are there as a good starting point, um, but certainly considering the risk. Um, I, I accept, I, I think that nowadays um, people are more likely to follow codes, you know, because it's, it's certainly the, the less riskier um, perspective to be, um, and, and I, I wouldn't blame people for doing that, and certainly whatever you're uh, prescribing uh, within your risk assessments, it sh you should be looking at an equal level of safety. Uh, and uh, to, to ensure in what, whatever you're um, um, ad advising is ultimately safe. But I, there are two um, quotes down here that I've used, which are both from determinations. The one on the left is from um, the, the uh, what was CLG at the time, Secretary of State. Uh, that's a determination under the fire safety order, basically saying that the guidance is there, but it, it should be applied flexibly and the level of uh, protection should be proportionate. And, and the one on the right there is from Scotland, and again, saying that it's, uh, the guides are not meant to be prescriptive on min minimum standards to be applied. It is flexible. Okay, that is the view of, um, of the government. Um, some, very quickly, um, something that we, uh, the fire risk assessment does also cover is, uh, sorry, the past does cover is the competence of the assessor. It does talk about um, the competence of what a fire risk assessor looks like. Um, and it makes basically ensuring that you've got appropriate knowledge and experience for what you're doing. Um, but also the key thing that qualifications don't necessarily suggest competence. Now, I think that's actually very important. Um, for example, I, I've worked with um, some chartered fire engineers, um, over, over these exceptional fire engineers, um, but I wouldn't send them to a fire risk assessment because they're just not in that mindset um, of doing it. Conducting a fire risk assessment is a very different methodology or mindset, sorry, to perhaps doing structural fire engineering. You know, there's, there's two, they're two they're miles apart uh, in understanding what's required. Um, so are the qualifications appropriate is what I'm trying to say. Um, but even simple building assessors do require, uh, you know, an understanding of um, relevant uh, fire safety practices for, for the buildings they're looking at, uh, certainly an awareness of their own limitations and obviously being able or wanting to supplement their existing knowledge by external people if necessary. I think when we look at competency, you know, the competency of perhaps doing these types of buildings, even though top right pubs can be tricky, they can be tricky little buildings, um, it can be entirely different to looking at these sort of buildings. So it just really is thinking about what you're doing uh, from a competence perspective. Do you, you, you know, do you hold the right experience and qualifications and training? Uh, and this is what PAS 79 would suggest that a competent risk assessor should understand. Uh, they should understand the, the assessment of the risk from fire, clearly. Um, applicable legislation, appropriate guidance, the behaviour of, of fire in buildings, you know, fire behaviour, uh, the behaviour of people in fire situations, uh, means of escape, 
fire protection, uh, fire prevention, uh, and management of fire safety. They're the areas of which um, a fire risk assessor should understand to be competent. Uh, I appreciate that's a real whistle stop tour of PAS 79. Obviously, we've only really just touched the surface, um, but I will quite gladly um, open up to if anyone has any questions. I'm just aware that it's 10 to 9, I don't want to take too much of your time. Right. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> um, Hello, we have. You didn't hear me then. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, we have just had something come in, but what I would like to um, just cover off first, if that's okay, um, is with, with regard to today's session and the content that's um, that's been spoken about, we are actually offering um, a one-day course on this on the 1st of November, which Jamie will be delivering. And I didn't know, Jamie, if you just wanted to provide a little bit further information as to sort of like those bits that you would then look to cover um, in that session. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think... Um... Uh, obviously, th th this is really just uh, an overview of what uh, uh, PAS 79 is ultimately. Um, now, I, I think what, what we offer in the course, which, which is different, is, is actually then start to apply that to, to real life situations. We can talk a lot more in depth about the legal requirements uh, to ensure that we're covering um, all aspects of law, apply that into real life situations and talk about the technical issues which sit around that from a fire risk assessment um, point of view as well. Bring up examples, talk about what that looks like, um, which obviously you, you can't do in an hour session. Um, and what the fire uh, the risk assessment course does help if you've got people coming to it who, um, who obviously understand basic fire safety. Um, but if, if you've got a basic level of uh, fire safety and uh, looking to uh, try and convert that into, into doing risk assessments in um, a sensible way, I suppose, a proportionate way, then certainly we, we do that on the day. Um, and, the, and the feedback's always been excellent on the courses. So, uh, you know, I enjoyed teaching it too. Excellent. Well, what we'll do is um, at the end of this session, when the email comes out um, covering off today's session, there will be a link for anybody who is interested in um, in registering for that event. I'll include the registration link so so people can sign up. Um, in terms of questions, I'm going to be really honest. It's been very quiet out there. So if anybody does have any questions for Jamie on today's um, subject, now is the time to get typing and to send those in to us. Um, there has been a, a comment just um, saying that, you know, this morning's presentation, you know, very informative um, and excellent. And just just a, a bit of a note, really, that they're um, interested in hearing more about BS8524, if that's something that um, that you cover off at all. Sorry, Kate. Oh, hello. Yes, I didn't hear what it was. <laughs> um, the, the note is BS8524. Okay. Um, it's not something we necessarily cover. No. Okay. <laughs> not some, no, not, not something we, we necessarily cover. But uh, I, I mean, I, I don't see eight, eight, five, two, four. I don't see why we couldn't. Um, but I, I, I don't think we've even got any courses of fire curtains, have we? Um, not, I, I, not currently, no. But again, if, if you know, I'm kind of putting this out there. If there is an interest in in a specific area, then do let us know, and, and we can we can pick up on that. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, um, I, I, I'm aware of um, the old uh, PASS 121 and, and BS8524 from um, from a practitioner's perspective and design, um, but but I think if, if that's something which people want, they want to get into real nuances of that, it would probably be best if we try and seek out a manufacturer or something, Katie, that can really go into the real detail of that. Okay, well, um, yeah, we can definitely look into that. We can we can put that uh, sort of on the list as such. So, uh, mm. yeah, brilliant. Thank, thank you. Um, so no, nothing else um, sitting there at the moment. Um, it looks like it's a, a quiet Q and A for you. That's either a good or bad thing, isn't it? <laughs> um, I'll just uh, again, while I'm just giving people a couple of minutes just to send anything through, if, if there are any further questions, is just bring to people's attention the next webinar um, that we're going to be running. Now that's on the 9th of October. And we're going uh, to look at the latest in energy efficiency in buildings. And again, same thing. There'll be a registration uh, link into the uh, in the email that comes out shortly after this session. So uh, this session has been recorded. So if anybody did um, perhaps uh, miss some uh, areas, um, then we'll, it'll pop up onto our YouTube channel and you can catch up at your um, at leisure. Also, as well, if you've got any colleagues that you you know may find the content interesting, please do share with those because um, you know it's all about sharing the knowledge. So so please do. Uh, you send that round. Um, a question, um, forgive me for uh, my, my on this. What is ALARP? A L A R P? Someone's just asking. Uh, 
it's, it's as low as reasonably practicable. Um, it, it's obviously a, it's, it's a health and safety term more so. Um, and it, it, what it effectively means is that we're looking to reduce the risk uh, to obviously persons as, as low as we can, but it does factor in cost within that. That's where the reasonably practicable. Now, um, health and safety legislation asks for two things, uh, for, for uh, something to be done if it's practically possible. Uh, so if, if something is practically possible, regardless of cost, it must be done. But health and safety legislation also asks for as those reasonably practicable, where cost is balanced in. Now, the relevant case law to that is um, Edwards versus the National Coal Board in 1949, where effectively um, the judge said within making his uh, judgment that a person should uh, consider take the time trouble and expense into account when determining the necessary control measures so you basically factor in the cost the trouble does that outweigh the proportionality of the benefits it will give you in doing that so in other words if if someone's popping into um, a room to do something for 10 seconds um, where actually that they might be exposed to a moderate risk for, for those 10 seconds is it actually justifiable spending 10 million pounds for a control measure Probably not. Okay, and that's the whole point of reasonably practicable is it does factor cost into that decision. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Um, we've had a question saying where should the significant findings of an assessment be stored? Um, so entirely up to you, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> the, 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 that there is nothing um, within legislation that says where they have to be stored. Now, obviously, there's a degree of common sense comes into this uh, and says it would probably be a good idea to store it somewhere or stored in somewhere where they may or may not be affected by a fire. Now, I have been to fires previously um, as an investigating officer where we, we've uh, gone obviously to, to assess the fire safety arrangements and you say, well, do you have a fire risk assessment? And they say, well, yes, it was in there <laughs> <laughs> and then it's gone. Um, but uh, I, I think now with today's technology, most fire risk assessments, to be honest, sit on a computer hard drive somewhere and are sometimes cloud based. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a way of keeping it remote. But it certainly there's no requirement to anywhere that you, you have to keep it, but it would certainly be a method of best practice if, if you're keeping a hard copy to keep a backup copy somewhere um, or indeed to keep it electronic, um, you know, on a cloud server or backup server somewhere. So if you do have a fire or incident in the building, at least you're in a position you can defend and justify um, because ultimately if, if that's your only defense, what you've got within a fire risk assessment, should something either go to litigation or go to criminal proceedings, you're not then in a position to be able to show your fire risk assessment. So it's Certainly best practice to do that. I think that's absolutely fair enough and I think you're absolutely right you know most stuff nowadays is stored digitally and in the cloud so uh, yeah, absolutely. yeah I think, uh, I think as I they think say it's the way forward. It is and nowadays as well that there's lots of um, electronic fire risk assessment um, systems and programs out there you know in order to assist people to do that so th there's uh, particularly if you've got big multiple housing stocks as well or big stock it's impractical to store you know a thousand risk assessments on a shelf so that, that there, there are systems there to, to assist people to do that nowadays so that we're getting much more clever than what we were 10 years ago <laughs> Think things move on don't they um, Absolutely. <laughs> and i hope colin that answers your question anyway um i think that was a great answer there um right that's is it for the questions that we've had in this morning and also I'm conscious that we're just about to approach nine o'clock and we do allow an hour for these sessions so on that note um, again you can claim one hour CPD for this morning's webinar um, so what sort of remains for me to do is um, Jamie thank you for your time this morning and um, thank you You're for welcome. your session um, a lot of comments coming in saying how you know how people really enjoyed it great session informative and what have you so yeah, thank you thank you very much it's much appreciated and, uh, yeah, and for anybody, then they are the last thing as well is, sorry, uh, I was just going to say conference, yes. Um, yeah. If anybody is at conference in Manchester, beginning of October, um, be good to see you there. If anybody isn't coming to conference and is interested, uh, all information is on our website. I can include a link um, in the in the email again. So uh, it would be really useful, obviously, if you, um, if you want to come along and uh, join our annual conference. So last thing for me to do now is just say thank you very much again to Jamie. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your time. And um, we will see you on the next session. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. <laughs>